In 1908, state geologist S.W. McCauley published a bulletin about Georgia's fossil iron ores that included a wonderful black and white photograph of a mining camp near Estelle in northwest Georgia's Walker County. Opening the bulletin to that picture, I stepped right in, or it felt like it anyway. It showed a broad, grassy valley set in thickly forested mountains. To the right, railroad tracks arced through the valley and an engine was rounding the curve. On the left were six houses and several outbuildings of similar construction and apparently of like age. In the middle distance, the railroad tracks disappeared behind a copse of trees and a scattering of other houses and buildings. The caption read, General view of one of the mining camps at Estelle, Walker County, Georgia, without specifying the exact location. The curious modern reader might wonder, where was this taken? What does it look like today? Today, Estelle is a ghost town. We know it was located on what is now Georgia Highway 193, west of Lafayette in Walker County. Those old timers in the area that I spoke to figured the mining camp in the photo was Estelle itself. But Estelle had 175 houses for workers, two schools, mining and ore processing machinery and structures, and a standard gauge railroad, the Chattanooga Southern. So Estelle was much bigger than the community in the photo. So I decided to walk the Estelle Mines Trail to see if I could find the location of the mining camp in the photo. Then I walked the trail again, and again, and again. Located at the western foot of Pigeon Mountain, the three mile trail follows the long abandoned bed of the mining company's narrow gauge rail line. The trail and old rail bed pass through seven hand hewn tunnels, most of which are in precarious states of partial collapse like this one. The rock is rather loose and crumbly, and it's been a century since the mining company abandoned the tunnels. The thought of walking through an abandoned tunnel was unnerving since a cunningly timed cave-in would give local obituary page readers reason to shake their heads at the visitor's folly, but one tunnel was sufficiently intact to inspire confidence. A broad streak of rusty brown iron ore was evident. Rock fallen from the unsupported ceiling and sides littered the uneven floor, but the tunnel was short and enough light entered at both ends to permit careful passage at midday without a flashlight. In a few minutes, I exited the tunnel into the comparatively cheerful light of a drizzly overcast spring morning, exhaling woo in relief. About three miles into the hike, the railroad bed hiking trail approached a meadow as lush and colorful as an Augusta National Golf Course fairway in April. Several walnut trees stood in the meadow, their dark, ruggedly furrowed bark contrasting sharply with the springtime grass. This meadow looked like a remnant of pasture or a farm field. Might it be the same open fields shown in the 1908 photo? The three mile Estelle mine trail ends just beyond the meadow. From there, a hiker wishing to follow the old rail bed can walk the gravel Estelle Mines Road, which mostly traces the historic route about three miles to Georgia Highway 193. On this section, a short side trail leads to a seventh, the largest, tunnel. The Estelle Mines Road then ends at the site of the now vanished community of Estelle between Davis Crossroads and Lafayette. From Estelle, a century ago, iron ore was shipped via the Standard Gauge, Chattanooga, and Southern Railroad. Beginning in 1894, the Estelle Mining Company took iron ore from exposed rock, open pits, and mines sunk into Pigeon Mountain's ridges. This 1893 map shows the narrow gauge line extending a short distance south from Estelle. Over the next 20 years, the company extended the line south toward Voiles Creek. By 1908, it had reached Landlot 289. It ended near the site of today's Shirley Miller Wildflower Trail parking area, where I began each of my hikes. All along that rail line, spur tracks branched off to the company's mines and ore pits. Miners shoveled ore into carts on the spur tracks. Horses or mules pulled the loaded ore carts to tipples where the ore was fed into ore cars. 
The ore cars were pulled by a small four-wheeled porter engine commonly called a dinky. Old timers thus came to refer to the Estelle Mines rail system as the dinky line. The small engine in Macaulay's 1908 Estelle mining camp photograph is a dinky. Surface mining was the cheapest way to get ore, but when dirt and rock was more than 12 feet deep, the company dug mines into the mountainside. One of these was 146 feet long and led to a vein of iron 3 feet thick. Ore graded as soft was immediately loaded onto standard Chattanooga Southern Railroad cars at Estelle. Ore graded as hard was first processed through a rock crusher. This yielded 24 standard rail cars of ore daily. In Chattanooga, ore was used as pigment in making red paint. Since iron is one of the Earth's most abundant elements, red paint has always been the cheapest to manufacture. That's why so many of our barns and mills and outbuildings were painted rusty red. By 1924, the Estelle Mining Company had shut down for several years due to low ore prices. It never resumed business. Nature then began to reclaim the land, working to heal old mining scars like this pit as best it can. Here and there some old mining company ruins can still be found, but mostly the woods have reclaimed the sites. Since the 1908 photo wasn't taken at Estelle, I hiked the network of trails to see if I could locate the actual site. The green meadow with the dark walnut trees beside Voiles Creek seemed a logical place to start, but spring had sprung, the hardwood trees had leafed out, and there wasn't a good perspective of the surrounding ridges and gaps. There were lots of other things to see, wildflowers like phlox, dwarf-crested iris, and pinkster flower. Butterflies like this female eastern tiger swallowtail, a witch moth and a rat snake, and spring's abundant bird song truly made the trip memorable. I waited until the leaves came off the trees again. Actually, I waited longer, because this is a state wildlife management area that is heavily hunted during deer season. Then I returned in April. From the Shirley Miller Wildflower Parking Area, I walked the Estelle Mines Trail north along the old Narra Gauge Railroad. The path is often mucky and churned by horses. After about two miles, the old railroad bed hugs the ridgeside and overlooks the valley of Voiles Creek. Here, with the leaves off the trees, I found that the significant terrain features matched. From this vantage point in wintertime, the surrounding ridges and gaps were the same as in the 1908 photo. What little differences existed were because I took my photo from a slightly different angle and elevation. When I reached the north end of the Estelle Mines Trail, I took Branch Trail to Bluebird Gap, then the West Brow Trail up Pigeon Mountain, and then the north side of the Pocket Loop Trail to the crest of the mountain and back down to the parking area. This loop is nine difficult miles, especially in summer heat. Some of the trails are poorly marked and during warmer seasons overgrown and challenging to follow. The Estelle Mines Trail is usually easy to follow and comparatively tame, but don't try the full loop unless you really know what you're doing. Exploring a ghost town, a ghost railroad, ghost tunnels, and ghost mines is an appealing way to spend a day or three. So take a hike on the Estelle Mining Company Railroad. Be prepared for a muddy, messy trail and bring a flashlight if you wish to transit one or more of the tunnels. Have fun, and thank you for watching.